want to introduce, thank you. Hello, hello. Um, my name is uh, Victoria George. I am the Audience Lab Director at Arts Boston and also the founder of the Network for Arts and Ministries of Canada. <coughs> We are delighted to have you all here today. Um, before I introduce um, our mon uh, moderator for the evening and our panelists, I'd like to introduce you all to the Executive Director of the Boston Center for the Arts, uh, Gregory Ruffin. Thank you. I just wanted to say hello and welcome to Boston Center for the Arts. Is this anybody's first time here in the Plaza Theaters? Oh, wonderful. I love seeing the newbies. This is great. So we here are the nexus of the arts in Boston. We are the place where people come to incubate their art. They come to experiment. They come to explore. They come to collaborate. And it often starts right here in these spaces. So we are very happy when somebody comes in and says, I've never seen this space before. I've never been here. And it's your opportunity to come and try something new. Behind us, Company One, who's one of our resident companies, has been here at the BCA since their founding has given us a space to be able to have this evening. Uh, so it's really not BCA that's given up the space, but, but Company One. So if you happen, haven't seen Hype Man, get here before the 24th this weekend. Come back and see it, because it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so we are, are, are very, very pleased to be able to have Amplifying Voices here. And thank you so much for bringing Arts Boston and the programming here to Boston Center of the Arts. <laughs> Gregory, uh, thank you so much for allowing us to use this space and to be here this evening. And also a huge thank you to Company One for letting us um, If you haven't seen Hype Man yet, you are missing out on an incredible, incredible play. Production, acting, everything is fantastic. So please make sure you see it before it's too late because you'll be mad. <laughs> so, um, so thank you again, Summer Williams, for letting us use this space, and Gregory for, as well for, for letting us use this space. So uh, this is the second in the uh, a, a series of three conversations um, featuring leaders of color in the arts. The first one we did back in December at the Pow Arts Center, which was fantastic, and we have a few of the panelists here this evening. Um, and so we are really just trying as best as we can to have the Boston community, the arts sector, and beyond learn about and hear from these wonderful leaders of color who are in the arts. Uh, the narrative that we often hear is that there aren't enough qualified uh, people of color who are either leading organizations um, or even involved in the arts community, and that is uh, false. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Christian Guerra. So Chris is our moderator for this evening. She is the Art Collection and Program Manager for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Chris oversees the physical and intellectual care, custody, and maintenance of over 500 works of public art owned by the City of Boston. Uh, Chris also supervises the Boston Arts Council's submission and approval process of public arts projects and guides the development of city commissioned projects like the Boston uh, Artists in Residence, so Boston Air. An important part of Chris's uh, position is to advocate on behalf of the Collection for Resources, act as a liaison to the community, and work to safeguard artists' rights and prioritize cultural equity in relation to the city's public art program. So welcome to you all, and welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me today, and I will quickly move into acknowledging our evening speakers. Uh, Susan Chinson is the festival director of the Boston Asian American Film Festival and the Managing Director of the Chinese Historical Society. <laughs> Summer L. Williams is the Associate Artistic Director of Company One Theater. <laughs> Veronica Robles is the Founder and Director of the Veronica Robles Cultural Center. So our first question tonight is, 
as evidenced by the people in this room and on the stage, uh, Boston is a city of change makers, um, passionate about pushing mission-driven work and excellent art. Uh, as leaders in your own organizations, what are your professional values or your organization's values that play into decision making around the program and project development that you do? Specifically, I'm going to call out Veronica. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for, for uh, inviting us to be part of this panel. Um, I am a performer. I started um, my professional career when I was 14 years old. When I had the opportunity to be on a stage and see that I have uh, uh, the opportunity to, to share a message and uh, the opportunity to uh, be in people's minds somehow with my art, I decided that I have to have a mission. How am I going to do what I'm going to do about it? So as a young person, I was worried about me and the youth, right? <laughs> because as a youth, you're always having problems and issues because you are learning about the world and nobody understands you and things like that. <laughs> I, um, I just saw myself and uh, uh, in all those people and I decided one of the things that I that I think we need in this world is love. And I'm very romantic, and I've been living my life like that. And I am a living proof that love is a powerful tool in your life. And that's my mission. My mission is just to make sure that people understand that love is a powerful tool that comes within you as a default. You don't have to add it. It's right there. That, that just, that, that's your ignition. So, um, you know, I was happy about everything. I didn't get mad for anything. Uh, the world take me places. I, uh, I got married, I got a, a daughter, and uh, thank God singing has been my life, and I've been making money out of singing Mexican music uh, with my big hat. <laughs> and also, as a, as a young person, I felt the, the, the pressure of being sexy and, and pretty and, and always expose your body. But I, I tried to do it a couple of times on stage, but I couldn't do it. Because, <laughs> you know, I am, I always, as I said, I like hugging and kissing people, and everyone on the streets, I, ju I just took my mother, she said, quiet, you don't have to say hello to everyone. And I'm like, why not? Anyway, so with my, my mariachi outfit covered from bottom to top, I felt really good and, and that allowed me to do who I am uh, and, and that I took it as another powerful tool, tool for my life to be myself. So being covered from bottom to top gave me an enormous power of being myself and always being myself everywhere I went. Then I, I came to the United States um, again and, and I used to sing in, in Spanish for Anglo people. They really loved me singing and expressing, but I didn't speak English, so I was trying to say everything I <laughs> with my mimics. But then I, 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 you know, life made me stay here in the United States, and, um, and then I have to learn the language a little bit. And then I ended up in Boston for a long vacation, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started um, uh, volunteering my time because I saw the lack of representation of the Latino community, uh, arts and culture, the traditional dance and music. I love dancing and through my singing career I got the opportunity to travel to different countries first, I mean within Mexico first and then within Latin America and learn about the traditional arts that again is the, the traditional arts that brings the value, the family values, the, the values that brings community together. So that's my value and that's the value that I wanted to share with the mission and vision of the Veronica Robles Cultural Center. So um, I started working with the community and again, it's, it is hard because the community really needs something, they, our children need something that really looks look like them, that they need role models and they also need to know that our cultures that's another thing that I learned here in the United States in traveling different worlds. It doesn't really matter where are you coming from, where if it's in Asia or in Africa, whatever. The values of bringing people together, which is family and love, are the same. It doesn't matter what is your skin color 
or your language. Our, those values are the same. So our mission, I decided to open the cultural center because I really didn't see a place where we really foster those values through traditional arts. And, um, and every decision we make in the organization is based on that. We don't really like, if there's money there for a grant, you know, if it's, it doesn't align with our values, we don't do it. Because that's why we opened the place in, front of, in the first place. And um, our, our mission is to promote Latin American arts and culture as an engine for stronger communities and economic growth. Why engine for stronger communities? Because of that, because we're losing our children, the parents are losing their children, because some of the parents, they don't speak English, and at, at the, uh, when the, the kids are at, um, in their teenage age, they don't want to speak their language. If they don't start when they were very little, they won't, they won't do it. After when they're 15, 16 years old, they won't do it. And then they lose the bond with their families because parents cannot really tell them what's good or bad because they they don't want to, they don't speak Spanish neither. So the, the bond is broken and nobody will bring them back. So we just want to make sure that we start from the very beginning so that bond, which is love, it's not broken. So that's why, that's why we open it. So then uh, our, our values, uh, it's to teach, inspire, and perpetuate those values that bring, bring the community together. So that's why we, uh, at Veronica Robles Cultural Center, um, uh, when every decision we make, we make it based on that. And uh, it is important for me, thank you for this opportunity, because this is the message after uh, your life experience. I have a daughter, she, she was a beautiful dancer, and she, we moved, we went to Florida, and she danced beautifully. She loved dancing, whatever, you know, dance came to her body and music. So we went to Florida to the school, and she wanted to audition for, for, um, for a school. And she said, they asked her what would she represent, and she said, oh, I'm going to dance a folkloric dance from another Cuba, I think, or, or Colombia, I don't remember. And, they said, and the lady said, why? No, no, don't do that. That's not important. Choose another thing, like ballet or, or something else, sing or something. And so she came hard broken to my house and she said, mommy, why are we doing all this? This is bullshit. Like, nobody cares. And I'm like, that lady don't care. Everybody else will. Like, don't pay attention to that. Then later on, we came back to Boston and my daughter passed away. She was 17 years old. Uh, then after that, I had cancer, uh, four stage cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. So when I, uh, when they told me that I was a cancer survivor, was when I decided to, I need to do something in this life because what I have inside, it can stay there. I just want to make sure that people understand that okay, material things are important, but those are just material things. We just need to be more focused on what we really enjoy, create memories, make memories with, uh, with our children, with our families, with our neighbors. We really need to hold hands and be together around arts, around culture. And that's why we are there. That's why we, we, we are in, in East Boston at the Veronica Robles Cultural Center. Thank you very much. <laughs> of 
the idea around impact and impact for the people of the city of Boston is to move toward action. Um, and so a lot of our work uh, has been about um, voices that have not been heard and figuring out how to amplify those voices and figuring out how to do a better job of continually amplifying those voices so that what's uh, reflected in the city of Boston and not this kind of like um, artificial sense of Boston, but like really everyone that lives in Boston can be reflected on stage, in the audiences, uh, on our staff, on our board. Uh, and now the goal is to have an impact of action. So we're really thinking about how do we not only encourage people to have a theatrical experience, which will, uh, which creates empathy, quite frankly, like helps other people to see themselves in situations that maybe they wouldn't see themselves in, helps them to have a better sense of understanding, and then move toward a what can I do to make change. Um, and so that's the impact that we overall hope to have. It's hard talking about things that are um, serious um, in this art form, but it's necessary. It is hard to help people understand that this is just a stepping stone. Like, it's, it's great, it's gonna be wonderful when you all come here and see Hype Man before it closes on Saturday. <laughs> It'll be wonderful when you do that. It will be even better when you decide to maybe get involved with Black Lives Matter. It will be even better when you decide to think about your allyship. It will be even better when you think about, well, what can I do uh, in my professional life to make sure it's more reflective of the people that I see in Boston, and that's the impact that we're trying to have. Um, and it's been a slow but steady race. Uh, it didn't happen overnight, uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, and it's a part of that um, steady growth and development that we are pushing ourselves through that will help us to continue to make art that will then push through the idea of uh, the impact that we really want to see on this city. We want to be a lasting institution. We want to be an institution that leaves an indelible mark on Boston. Boston is intentional. Uh, we could have been a bunch of college kids who went anywhere. We could have gone to New York, but we chose Boston because there was something about what wasn't happening in Boston that needed to be addressed. And I feel, quite frankly, <clears throat> that we've done that portion. And now we're on to the next stage, uh, which is bigger and better and harder, but necessary. Did I do it? <laughs> Um, so again, when you talk about moving young people from an arts education place to a, a place where they are the producers and sustainers of, and bearers of culture, so that's the kind of impact that I'm accustomed to. And understanding um, where I come from in Dallas and just like the theater offensive, we work um, strategically in four communities, Roxbury, um, the South End, Dorchester, and Jamaica Plain. 
um, that culture happens in community, it belongs to community, and it's not something that's always exported and highly resourced and then sold back to community, or you beg community to come to where you are um, to experience it. So again, how do you kind of keep culture in the community and uplift what's happening organically um, in community? Um, so I know from experience and kind of believe that that's where Boston is and where it, it can be. Um, so the work that we do as a community center, um, cultural institute, as an artist center, cultural institute is like how do we eliminate barriers um, and um, to resources, but also how do we center community um, and artists' voice. And our largest program is with queer youth. Now, at one point in my life, I used to be a queer youth. <laughs> and, you know, I grew up in a family that let me be as sassy and opinionated as I wanted to be. Um, so I can say from experience, like queer youth, you know, um, if given the chance, um, they can kind of lead you and guide you and tell you the kind of impact they can have if there's an opportunity there. So that's our largest program. Um, it is a program that keeps us on our toes. Um, because the queer youth bring fire every day. Um, but again, and we're interested in, in you know, how does art um, um, defeat racism, right? How does it give access to some other kind of social ills? Um, and, and also heighten the reality of what um, queer and trans individuals, in particular, especially queer and trans people of color, are dealing with, right? So um, looking at intersectionality and how in Boston, you know, which is kind of different from where I come from in Dallas, um, where queer and trans people of color are also um, dealing with things like immigration, um, homelessness, and things like that. So I think the impact, again, is unmeasurable. Um, sometimes it is a just safe space. Sometimes it's a place um, to be in community with people who understand. Sometimes it's a warm meal. And a lot of times it is fierce cultural production. <laughs> Wanted and understood. 
And I think the film festival has certainly strived to do that. And myself, as a sort of a person, I really come at it more as an audience member. And because Boston um, presented, there's a lot of institutions in Boston that present a lot of Asian content, but not specifically Asian American. Um, and it was sort of that need that existed and trying to find other like-minded, sort of to find my tribe. Um, that, you know, that that sort of is where it stemmed from and that's sort of how it's grown. But I think, you know, honestly, um, you know, I'm human. I think that's sort of part of, you know, the, um, you know, the privilege that I have in my role and being a curator and being the festival director and sort of helping establish it as such. Um, you know, I think I don't often realize that privilege that I have and so, you know, you're kind of curating, and we make mistakes. I'm human, and I think it's something I'm also trying to, you know, still struggle with. You know, it, it, these things, like, you don't always hit it on the head. Um, I'm grateful and thankful that there are so many people who have um, been touched by, you know, the space that the festival has created and the film, the films that we present, the filmmakers and, you know, the volunteers, and, you know, there's definitely a community there. Um, but, you know, there have been times when I think, you know, sometimes the mark is a little bit off and it's kind of embarrassing. Like, I kind of like, oh, can I really, did that really happen? And, um, you know, I, it's something I still struggle with, but I think trying to figure out how to be re respectful of that, I, uh, I don't have an answer for it. I really wish that didn't happen, but it does. Um, so, you know, that's sort of how I feel like I have to, I come with it is I make mistakes still. And, um, trying to trust in the process of um, it being a community process and effort and contribution that you know I rely I think on a lot of the volunteers um, audience participation and feedback to sort of let us know like when we're we're hitting it on the mark and trying to keep striving for that. So in 2010, I believe, is when we made our um, programmatic shift as an organization to work in those four, um, work strategically in those four neighborhoods. There was a couple of things that the organization knew at that point. Um, I think the staff representation and board representation didn't necessarily reflect um, the communities that we were in. Um, so we had to change that, right? Um, so we worked strategically um, to get more people of color on staff. Um, and people, not only people of color, but also people who were coming directly from the neighborhoods we worked in. Um, we worked strategically to get more board members um, of color on staff and board members coming from the neighborhoods that we worked in. Um, A, so we can have um, critical voice and accountability um, from um, the stakeholders, right? So the board members and staffs. And then also, how did we, how did the question, you know, again, how do we um, create opportunities for accountability within the community. So we have a community speak out um, that has been annually, which is kind of like a town hall, a creative town hall, um, where community kind of um, evaluates and also dreams with us around the program that they would like to see. Um, we're working this year, uh, and, 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 and it's been impactful, right? So we have changed programs. Uh, we've created programs based on um, what we've heard. Um, and we've been called to action, you know, um, about you know how we show up and how we can show up better um, based on needs. Um, and so now, uh, shameless plug. So again, I'm new. I don't know a lot. So the staff made sure I had every note and print out, <laughs> and all they highlighted things. But I was supposed to mention um, that our next community speak out for the South End um, is Monday, March 19th at the Villa Victoria. Um, Center for the Arts, and we're taking that model to every community that we show up in and just saying, you know, what are you seeing um, and how can we be a part of that and how can you hold us accountable um, to that, the, the work that we say that we want to do to our mission. Um, another way, again, is that, you know, we have traditional kind of surveys um, and opportunities for artists who engage either our artist res residency program um, or community programs to give us feedback but they also know that they have access to us 24 seven. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in, you know, we looked at the amount of money that we have and what we can actually place on a project and said, where do we have, you know, critical impact um, 
and a lot of it is in you know, technical assistance, professional development, and some kind of creation of programs. And so again, you cannot do that without being in conversation with the creators, or are the creators even critiquing you and your process um, around it? So there's a, a lot of different ways that's ingrained, I think, in our organization um, that it shows up um, on multiple levels. And then, again, if I need to reiterate, you know, the youth, we didn't have to create space for them to hold us accountable. They, they um, were doing it anyway. Um, but we have a leadership and inclusion council um, that's made up of youth who've been a part of our program. Um, and every program that um, has youth involvement or it's meant for youth has to go through that leadership and inclusion council um, to have youth feedback. Um, then when you love so much, you need to also show that you, your work is actually having an impact in the community. So we create job opportunities for uh, in the traditional arts for youth. We actually, in East Boston, we have a lot of violence on the streets and a lot of people complain about it or went out with the candles and everything. So since I lost a child, I, I, I really really didn't feel like going out on those um, activities. So, and I'm like, I'm already doing something. I'm, I'm already making sure that those kids don't don't grow up with with that, you know, feeling of hatred. They, they just hear loving each other, interacting with everyone, with the intergenerational um, and cross-generational relationship through our events. Uh, so, we started creating um, jobs, um, trying to bring those things that we have in our communities, like the, the corn on the cob, a street corn. Any, any of you have it, uh, street corn? Yeah? So th that are, is very popular on the streets of our countries. So the first uh, year, we, we shipped the, 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 co the buy from Mexico City, and um, we put the Jews to work. Let me tell you, these girls and these boys from Central America, I was trying to explain them how to, no, let me tell you. <laughs> and I go, oh my God, so they took over the business. <laughs> they know how to do it. They were so into it, so proud of it. And everybody around them talking about it and they were feeling so proud about it. You know, this, the street corn is just corn. But the tradition, and, and so this way we provide this type of jobs to them so they can feel that their culture is somehow uh, attractive and, and interesting. And, and through that, you can uh, get, you know, create community too. So we have that, and uh, we also support aspiring professional artists. Right now, we, we are supporting um, uh, salsa dancers. There are a couple of, of boys that wanted to have their project. So V Rock is the home to. Uh, uh, Mambo, uh, Mambo House of uh, Salsa, House of Mambo. It's a New York style on two salsa. So they're teaching there and they're doing socials and they're earning some money. Um, and uh, we also have networking opportunities for everyone. We also connect those resources with our community. We um, last year we. With, uh, with the mayor, uh, we have um, uh, an immigration informational um, session. We also have a Know Your Rights. We also have an a, a entrepreneur uh, conversations. We bring people who are uh, on the creative uh, business so people know how to you know, establish their, their business in the creative sector. Um, we also have, um, we, we have a, an, an area where we uh, encourage youth uh, to use multimedia to, you know, give a message or also as a way to get to know people in, in business or in, in, in sectors that probably they would never have the opportunity otherwise. So last year we created the Through the Eyes of the Youth, uh, which is a video project. That it's a kind of a, a, a blog that uh, we started with a magazine. We uh, send the kids to on summer to one to one of those uh, flag racings from Latin America, uh, the Peruvian one. So the kids got to uh, um, interview the people there. You you have to see what they wrote. It's amazing. And then uh, we created the video blog, and um, so the kids interview CEOs 
and they ask them questions like, what is your culture um, doing with your business? How that have an impact on your business and on your family? Things like that, and, and from those things, uh, we create amazing opportunities for this youth. Um, and our programs are uh, based on, as, as we say, our values, but we also want to, and, and, and our mission is that uh, community and economic growth. So we want to make sure that the arts, like myself, I, I am Mexican, I sing in Spanish, and that's my business. That's what I do here. That's how I pay the, 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 the organization. It's a non-profit organization, but this humble Mexican is financing everything with my husband. It's, we're, we have spent over $5,100 from our pocket. We don't ask anybody. And that's with my art. So that's another thing that I want to, the, the, the youth and other artists know that if they're responsible, they're really passionate about it, they really take it seriously, they can make it happen. It's just that they need to work for it like any other career. Also, this is a professional career too. So we have to change that. We have to make sure that the community understands that art is a career. We're actually professionals. We don't need to. And that's how we find it. We also, we also uh, started doing service, um, uh, like traditional service, so we, we get the feedback from people. And uh, you are welcome to come to any of our events and, and, and enjoy what we do there. Uh, we were granted with the, um, um, the old library uh, in East Boston on Meridian Street with other three organizations. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be moving to that um, um, uh, building and we will also <laughs> go not only do Latin American traditional arts, but in our business plan is also to open up to other traditional arts that represent that side of the community. So that's how we, uh, we were working right now. We're learning as, as, uh, many challenges we have to go through. But uh, we're, we're there and we're working and, and I think we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Um, I, I think, I mean, money and time, but that's a given, right? That's a given. So outside of those things, I think the, the biggest difficulty is convincing not everyone believes in the power of what it is that we are choosing to do. And because not everyone believes in the power of what we're choosing to do, not everyone is able to understand the impact that it can have. Because they don't understand the impact that it can have, they're less likely to support it because they feel like its impact is going to be small or insular, It'll only reach a few people, as opposed to understanding the kind of like drop in a puddle sort of thing, right? Where the thing drops and then there are things that ripple out endlessly. Uh, and I think that's our biggest challenge is that uh, it would be wonderful if people really took more time to just trust and believe when we say there is an impact, right? Not make us spend all this time to prove what the impact is, but to just trust and believe that there is an impact, to come and be witness to uh, a person having a moment where they are awakened to something and then seeing the effect of that and then deciding to pour in to the organization in terms of resources that are finite and also infinite. Uh, so it supports where, and this is where it's going to get a little dicey, it supports where people say they want to see the city go. And I think people say a lot of things about where they want to see any place move toward. Uh, move toward or move to, um, but it gets really tricky to have those things, uh, plans be put into action in a more immediate sense, um, which is what I think all 
places need, right? They need action now. Um, and I think there's a great demand for action now on a host of issues. Um, it's just harder to get people to hear it um, because they're a little afraid of what that might mean. That seems sad. <laughs> So at the Theater Offensive, you know, our organization is close to 30 years old. Um, we have an organizational value and a statement that says, um, <laughs> defeating homophobia in our neighborhoods requires defeating and I would add undoing racism too, right? Um, and so as an organization right now, we're sitting um, with the complexities of what it means to undo racism, right? What it means to examine um, the historical impact and also the current actions of white supremacy um, within our organization, within um, communities, and things like that, because 30 years of allegiance to a um, nonprofit industrial complex and, and models that really isn't serving our, our type of organization anyway, um, it's time you know, to think through all those complexities and propose and enact uh, a different way. Um, and so I gave some, st uh, I didn't get stats, but um, you know, we have a lot more people of color um, within our organization um, who are sitting with the complexity alongside of you know, our white um, counterparts and our white allies. And so, you know, I'm always down for a good undoing racism, <laughs> strategic, you know, it, it takes a lot. Um, but the one thing that I've come to understand about institutional racism, like it literally takes your breath. Um, and so we're at this moment um, within our organization where we know this is where we need to go um, because we have the right team, so the board, is, we have the right staff, and Boston really is the right community to talk about what it means to undo racism and homophobia um, kind of simultaneously and then um, share that with other parts of the world. Um, it requires us to, you know, bring our full selves, like to be honest. Um, about histories and systems that we benefit from, whether we want to or not, um, and be open to change, which is hard because when you are on the privileged side of whatever equation, you can sit kind of comfortably. So, you know, what does it mean to like become uncomfortable and even dream, right? So I'm guided by black radical thought, African futurism that says another world is possible, um, but we have to start enacting that world today. So again, we're an intergenerational organization, um, so, you know, some fun times and some, 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 some <laughs> conversations that we're having. Um, and even, you know, things that we're trying, right? So we don't, again, there's a time element that we know um, it's not going to happen uh, within this strategic plan. Um, everything that we need to do, but we're really, really committed um, to that mm -hmm. type of work. So if you're a praying person, you know, you can add my name to the altar, um, whatever you do. Um, because again, you know, if, if you have been a part of any kind of social movement and understand or benefited from the impact uh, of it, you know that it's hard, but it's kind of required right now. Um, in terms of Boston, I can use my answer, I don't know, I just got here, um, around, you know, what the opportunities are, but I can talk about like a hope um, and what I would really like to see um, and, and understand is Boston's investment in local artists and the local arts community here. Um, I know what kind of happens nationwide, and oftentimes it's the local people, the, you know, the taxpayers, the ones that are born and raised and committed to a place that get the short end of the stick. Um, but really, outsiders, we look at um, how you're investing in local community to decide <laughs> if we want to go there or if we want to move. So again, Boston has this opportunity um, to either amplify their work and really understand, you know, in, in my radical thinking, right? Um, and this is probably why they made me leave Dallas. No. Um, <laughs> you know, because I work for the city and encouraging what does like bottom up economics look like, right? So, what do we give the most money to the organizations we have historically given the least to? And let people at the top of this equation figure out how to sustain um, and build. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if Boston is interested in that type of. Um, um, engagements where historically, you know, organizations that's because of size and staff and that are not required to, you know, prove the impact over and over again just 
because somehow, you know, and we don't know how, they've been able to acquire such wealth. You know, we, we're still trying to figure out how wealthy people sustain wealth. Uh, what I say is that, oh, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> what I say, <laughs> this is why they hired me, honestly. Uh, what I say, you know, it's up the labor. <laughs> It's not the labor of poor people, and largely poor people of color, right, that sustains a certain type of wealth. So again, so if we reverse that, um, and that's the invitation I have to Boston, um, let's reverse that and see, you know, if the top dogs can sustain the ways in which, you know, these grassroots organizations who we've been given our blood, sweat, and tears and all of our resources have sustained and built. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's something that I'm very positive and uh, very humble from the very beginning, but being actually investing in the community, uh, I also notice uh, that there is no inclusion on opportunities for us as a minority in the institutional, you know, uh, sector. First. It was because I wasn't a 501c3, right? I was just a volunteer in the community trying to do things, so not even myself thought about getting into like Boston uh, institutions and getting money because I, I wasn't a 501c3. Then I said, okay, let's institutionalize what, what we're doing. So we decided to open the cultural center and try to do the way we, we're supposed to do it, so we don't, we're there. Um, I visit school as an artist, as a performer. I, I get hired to go to schools, uh, to the different cities uh, be, um, of Boston and other states and other countries. They pay me, that's what I do, that's my business. I charge, I charge, charge $800 per hour. And yeah, that's what I make myself as a this single woman, Mexican woman. In Boston, I volunteer my life. Everything I pay for, I teach and I give my life to Boston. I learn and because I've been volunteer in the system, Boston Public Schools, I really want to see what I do in the ethnic traditional arts in schools. So I've been trying and trying and trying. I, I apply, I never knew about grants because it's my business. So just how much? I don't even have meetings. I do it on my pyjama, my contract, you come, I go, I do my thing, and then I leave, and so happy, blah, blah, blah. And I have a spread and, and get love from everyone. Here I have to work so hard. <laughs> anyway, so I volunteer also. I work in a project for Boston Public Schools. It was called um, uh, the uh, Heritage Academies. Uh, we work with Harvard, a project from Harvard. I just went there to volunteer. I ended up being the director of the program. I don't know how that worked, but I <laughs> made things. Because everybody was, you know, uh, we should teach Spanish with traditional way or just through the arts, whatever. So I tried to bring both together. So I, 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 I um, you know, I came out with a project and a plan that we were successfully, you know, completed the program. Then uh, I saw the organizations, big organizations that were providing the summer programs and the after school programs for the children. And uh, that's how I got the idea. Okay, okay, we, we need to do something so we can be like those organizations to bring these activities to schools. But it's been so hard, really. And then I apply as an artist because I want to go to the schools to make sure that the, the, the kids get exposed to the traditional arts. Now, and, uh, First Latin American, but of course, I would love to see all traditional arts represented in our schools. Then I go to the schools and I ask the kids, where is Latin America? Where is Canada? Where are they? And they don't know. They are seven, eight grade and they don't know. They don't know what a circumference is because when I teach dance, I talk about geography, I talk about uh, geometry, and all of those things that are supposed to be in school. So when I go to schools here in the city, kids don't know that. And um, so, anyway. Uh, I applied for a grant um, and they denied it uh, because I really was applying not for the money, believe me, it's not about the money, it's just that we, I want to make sure that we bring this to the, to the East Boston community. 
So they denied the grant, it was investors, uh, because they said, my, my feed, the feedback was because I was, what was the feedback? Probably not experienced with uh, high school. So I've been teaching kids all my life, right? So, and then I don't wanna, I don't wanna apply again because it's a lot of work for me as an arts administrator, as a volunteer, and it's a lot of work. And then, and then the other thing that I see, they don't, they don't really get it, probably I need to teach them. The customs, <laughs> a skirt. I don't know if you have seen a skirt. From, that is about 16 to 20 yards of fabric. And so in all those yards, so each skirt alone, it's like over $100. And that's cheap because you, you, you bring it from other country, plus the shipping and everything. So when it comes to put on the budget something like that, they're oh, come on. It's, it's, it's a lot of work and it, it's expensive. And that's the thing, our, our traditional arts are put under, it's not an, a, a, I don't see that they take traditional arts as a fine arts. It's a fine art, and that's another thing. We really need to understand that traditional arts and the arts are fine art. It doesn't matter what kind of art. So that's a, that the other challenge that I see in our communities. And thank God, investors um, granted the money for me to go to the Humana Academy in East Boston. So right now, on another hand, so it's not that I'm complaining because they're doing a great job, but what I'm saying is that probably the panelists, they're not informed, they don't know about, so that's why we need more uh, venues for us to showcase our art. So I don't know if that happened to you. Yeah, so I was gonna just uh, comment, because I think that idea, of, this idea of even having this panel and amplifying voices and the fact that we're all sitting here in this room it is, there's been a lack of, I think, information and knowledge or lack of sort of elevation of the need for this. Um, I probably, as an example for the film festival, um, you know, we've, you know, been very fortunate and relied on other institutions in the Boston area to sort of support us, to recognize the work that we have been doing as valued, as important. Um, I think without our relationship with Arts Emerson and having access to uh, the Bright Family Screening Room, you know, at the Paramount, um, that's, you know, a world-class screening venue. I have filmmakers that come and say they have never screened their films in such a nice theater before. It, it's like, you know, bells and whistles to the nines. And, you know, to be able to say that, you know, we are able to provide that, this tiny little, you know, volunteer-type organization, um, for them to value that has gotten us to where we are at our 10th anniversary. Um, you know, sort of nationally known as a festival <laughs> worth coming to, that we respect filmmakers, that we care for their arts, that we want to be telling their stories, that there is an audience here. I think that was one of the biggest things, um, being, you know, a person here in Boston, that films wouldn't come to Boston, um, distributors wouldn't bring them, filmmakers wouldn't come here, because when they did, they didn't know where to find audiences. I would show up to places and there'd be a handful of us, and maybe 30, um, and then, you know, sort of now that we have a space and a, a vehicle to bring people together, I think, you know, the fact that we all have jobs as administrators, we have privilege and resources and access. And the fact that, you know, we even have this networking group is amazing. When I had heard about, you know, it starting, I was just sort of like, oh my gosh, like people that will understand the work, that will, you know, value the work that I do. Um, I'm just, you know, really excited to be here, and I, I just would probably want to just sort of leave with that piece that I think there's something that we can all do to support one another and um, help to continue to get our voices and stories told and to make a difference here in Boston because I think, you know, you're, you're mentioning, you know, is Boston ready to have some of these conversations? And I don't think we are. Like, we really are not. Uh, people think that they are, but just given you know the, what's happened in the past you know months past year, you know I'm feeling very challenged about that um, as a reality. But that yet there's still so much more need, and that we still have, we can't give up, and that we do what have to do. We have a lot of work still ahead of us, but we will continue to try because we have to do it. Yeah. Thank you.
you so much to our amazing panelists. Thank you so much, DCA. Thank you so much, Company One. Oh. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for coming out here and being a great audience. <laughs> Tuesday evening, even though it's nice out. Um, and again, I would love to thank our esteemed panelists. So thank you to Harold, to Veronica, Summer, and Susan, and thank you so much to Chris, our moderator. Um, <laughs> um, and last but not least, so um, our final uh, conversation in the series will be May 24th at the ICA Boston. So put that in your in your little calendar. Um, and we've got some wine and some snacks outside. So please join us outside. And um, oh, I'm shocked that you are not doing Q and A. I know. We didn't do that. Sorry, that is my fault. Oh, that is my fault. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I not that I have anything burning to say. I've <laughs> I was at an event at BCA, I guess, last weekend called uh, Seeking Sanctuary. Uh, it involved a stream group called Palaver, which is sort of in residence, as well as people from the Chinese community, the Irish community, and the Cape Verdean community. So they played the Chinese, Cape Verde, and uh, Irish music, but that was interspersed with people from those various individual communities, in most cases young kids, talking about their stories. And what I realized was that the interaction of those stories was incredibly powerful and suggested to folks over at the BCA that maybe this continue. So picking up on your point, and I think I, I don't get your name, I'm sorry. Susan. I was starting to think about in, um, into interaction. Let's say there are four groups represented here. What if there was a, a collaboration among those four groups as well as others? bringing in people from representing those groups to tell their stories and perhaps having music. I don't think there should be an emulation exactly of what happened with a Seeking Sanctuary. But the point of, of uh, sort of breaking down barriers and where the collective is more than the individual parts and building on that to, I think, deal with the point you were raising. I think everybody in one way or another uh, was raising, how do you break through the constraints Many of them are self-imposed, but the others are imposed by the, you know, sclerotic-ness of this city. But, but looking at the assets that are there, whether they're performers or whatever they are, but they're parts of your community and sort of digging out that and giving people free reign to talk about themselves, talk about their lives here, how they got here, what they're doing here, what they would like to do here, and what is the music that they listen to while they're thinking about that. I would just make a comment that I think that's sort of what, in a sense, Arts Emerson has offered the film festival that opportunity to do and sort of share their resources with us to be able to, for the film festival to tell our own stories and to bring our own filmmakers and to curate, you know, those different voices. I think, you know, we've tried to also, you know, be um, intentional about sort of some of the intersections that we try to address in terms of, you know, mental health, LGBTQ issues, um, you know, Blasian narratives was probably one of our most successful um, screenings that we held, it won our audience award last last festival, but really talking about sort of these multi-racial um, backgrounds that people come from because it's not black and white anymore and that these are complex things. And so, you know, I think the idea that um, within our various cultural institutions that we work within to create space and be thoughtful about, you know, in your, your own curation or just how resources are made available or who you invite to the table makes makes a big difference. So I think um, one of the things that we kind of notice in our neighborhood model is that those kind of collaborations with uh, amongst artists and even um, arts organizations were already happening. Um, so if it was a question of did we know about it or if we didn't know about it, um, were we experiencing it and, and why? And again, I think that's why we moved to a model of, again, keeping art 
and, and culture really um, where it happens and then either kind of making connections. So we think about our audience as much as we think about our artists, right? And who should experience this and why? Um, and, and where should they experience it? Because I think that also um, kind of may change some of the cultural authenticity um, when, if, if everything is exported. Um, and again, I think the question for us is, you know, how do we get the same resources from things that we take out of community into community to kind of sustain it? Um, our whole model is um, it's a um, <coughs> storytelling model um, that's based off of, of a Southern model from John O'Neill, um, from Free Southern Theater, where storytelling was, um, the story circle was used um, to just listen to community, right? So giving people the same amount of time and the same amount of prompt to hear what was coming up. Um, and in that model, you find that community and people were not listening to each other, even trying to fight for the same causes, but there was not a space to just be heard and share story and similar experience. So that's the model in which we kind of do a lot of our work. Um, but again, it's important because I think the risk of um, taking it out of community is again, community doesn't get to experience what they kind of created. And then there's a, I mean, there's a reason we have um, kind of high art centers if you want to use that, right? Um, and there's a reason arts districts exist away from um, neighborhoods, right? Um, so again, it's like, what is the bridge? What is the connection? Um, when I think about my own personal life and, and like the major impact, you know, it didn't necessarily come from the symphony because the symphony was one I didn't want to play, but the symphony was a field trip, right? Um, but what was happening in Singing Hills, Texas, you know, whether it was blues, barbecue, and you know, those are the things and, and that kind of organic storytelling that kind of shaped me. So again, like what's the bridge that brings those two worlds together? Um, I think it's my question. Uh, thank you guys so far. Um, I guess the major questions in my mind when I talk about culture and life are uh, how do you foster trust and money, right? Because we're all strangers at first, but we really should be all together. We're all connected, we're all here. How do you foster that trust along community lines then bring I guess, the money into those communities because that's ultimately what we're trying to get together, like, right? Love, trust, and community along with these projects. How do we foster more of that? That's not just in a setting like this, but like how do we really pump that in the community? So along with gentrification and politics and arts, we can actually have honest conversations that don't just get put into small rooms and don't really go out. Like how do we get it like daily? Like, like your community um, center sounds amazing. You're doing great work, but how do we really pump it? I don't want to get lost here. Mm -hmm. How do we pump the money and the knowledge back into the communities that really don't see it? So right now, uh, uh, trying with some experience that I gained through the five years that I will be here, we at the Cultural Center will receive over 2,000 people a year visiting with our events, 2,000 people from different different uh, aspects of life, different countries, you know, with multi uh, multicultural families, Latino families with different, you know, um, other cultures within their family. With our, with the uh, dance group, we reach out over 5,000 people a year because the, the youth perform all over the region. So we started spreading, uh, delivering a message. So last year, uh, our youth, after the performance or during the performance, they make a statement. Especially nowadays with these shootings, so those that I'm, I'm really worried about it. So I'm humbly doing what I'm doing. So I'm making sure that other kids understand that and they, they think that they have a the power of uh, delivering a message. So this year, we are uh, gathering together with parents and children and since we have that opportunity to be in front of an audience in different festivals from a variety of people from different you know cultures so this is what i think and i envision how we can use those resources that we already have as a performing a performers or performing artists and the performing artist area or you with uh, with uh, your uh, movie screening how we can deliver a message like Maybe we can put together uh, a message that it aligns 
with the same vision and mission and not just keeping it here. So we're trying to do that with learning, but uh, our compromise with the, with the community is that how we can, with the access we have to the community or those audiences, we can deliver a message that is powerful and that brings what we talk about here out and spread in the community. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if this is um, really going to answer your question at all. Let me just preface by saying this. Um, but it, I feel compelled because what you're what you're talking about is it's a that's a huge question. That is a huge question. I think it's something that we're all striving toward, right? Like, how do we make the thing that we care about and have uh, and that has an impact in this world go back into like feeding the people and the areas that need it, right? Like theater is such a, an elitist art form, right? It does not need to kind of keep perpetuating those cycles. Um, and so I think the closest answer that we are working toward as Company One Theater, um, and this is gonna take some time to figure out exactly what it means, but it feels like a step in those directions. Um, we started last season, we did a production at the library in Copley um, of a play called Peerless, and it was a pure, purely pay what you want model. And the benefit of that pay what you want model, not pay what you can, but pay what you want, um, did a couple of things. One, for some people who had never experienced theater, it removed the risk, right? Two, uh, it was it was in a public space, right? Like thinking about what are some of the last vestiges of like purely public spaces. The library is one of those things, um, and and open for everyone, right? So you can have someone who is super wealthy utilizing the library and someone who is transient using the library, right? It is a common good space. And so figuring out how to deliver, and I'm only talking about theater because that's what I know, right? But figuring out how to deliver theater uh, in a way that is one, really talking about accessibility in all of its forms, um, and also demystifying and like, <coughs> like bringing, breaking apart the myth that theater is not for everyone. And I think that's the biggest barrier currently because there are forces at play that work to uphold that every single day. Uh, and until those things start to get ripped away, that kind of funneling back into community is not going to happen because a part of what's not being funneled into community is meant to keep it separate from community and therefore meant to retain the position of power that theater holds in this society. And so I think all of those words mean <laughs> that as soon as we can figure out how to really uh, systematically go about breaking down what those barriers are, those other things won't be able to flow through. But when we do, <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> you know, I think that idea about money and sort of access to money and resources that we have for our organizations and the work that we want to be doing is a big one. Um, and I'm gonna just share sort of a bit of my naivete with all of you here. Um, I'm not like a big like political activist. Like I think I'm an activist in the sense like I um, support things and I will tell people and I will amplify voices and campaigns. But like I don't really understand or I haven't really understood how the political system works. But there are certainly things within a structure but it's like the establishment, right? There's an establishment that exists that I have always felt sort of like this from, right? Like that's the establishment and I'm over here and what I do is here. So with it, whatever is within my own confines is how I'm gonna make it happen. So it will continue to happen with it, whatever is within my access. But as I'm kind of coming to you know understand and as I try to become more uh, civically engaged and understand how the political system works, that there is a need for me to be more vocal about what it is that I do and why it's important and to tell and feel like others also have that 
capability of doing that. Uh, I'll just give this one example of, um, when I'm gonna give a plug, I don't know if Tracy is still here from Mass Creative, but um, you know, probably about two years ago, I was you know, sitting at my computer and I remember getting a call from them being like, hey, can you join us, you know, sign up as a thing and give us your support? And I was like, I don't know, I can't get my board to do that. That's gonna take like a whole vote and all this stuff and I don't, I've got like, I've got a, like a 20 other things that I do right now, so no, was my answer. But you know, I got these like emails about um, how you could just like sign a petition. I'm like, oh, I can sign a petition, change.org. You know, I can just click here, done, awesome. Um, but really, it was sort of like this gradual process of understanding. Like the next email I got was like, click on here, find out who your senator is, tell them why this is important. And I was like, here's an and here's an email. And I was like, whoa, this is easy. Click, click, click. And it was just amazing that Allison. And, and the next thing was like, oh, we're having this like lobby day. I'm like, lobby day? What do you do at a lobby day? Like, people, like these politicians want to hear, like, what, this is, I've never heard of this. This is, this is like mind blowing to me. But it was like, they're like, click here, find the phone number, make an appointment. And I was like, all right, let me just try this. And there was, I had an appointment with my elected official. Granted, I wasn't able to make it because my child got sick that day and stay home with them. Um, but I felt so incredibly empowered to think that these people that vote for policy can change and impact my life. Because literally, just like the year before, I had gotten one of my first grants, I think, from Mass Cultural Council and then uh, Mass Humanities. That Mass Humanities what killed me, but I got the money. Um, and it just made such a huge difference. Like, it wasn't a huge grant, but really just a few thousand dollars. Just, just gave me this like sigh of relief that I got it, like just that much money. And to think that you know, if I can help share that story with these politicians that are making these decisions, like you know, I've heard you know there's current proposals to kill the NEA and the NEH. I'm like, what is this world that we are living in? I, I just, I can't even. <laughs> I, I just want to go back and add because there's a addendum to my answer, and the answer is <laughs> the addendum to the answer is. So that was the path that I talked about, and I wanted to talk about what's going to happen moving forward. So this summer, uh, we are going to be producing a show um, called Leftovers at the Strand, uh, and we want to we're going to do that same uh, pay what you want model at the Strand, and the idea of where the dollars come in, in terms of the community, number one, we're like a little collector, so we're an itinerant <laughs> theater company, we go around all over the place, right? So we collect people, and we say, like, fall in love with us, and then follow us to wherever we go, right? And that we'll all kind of come together into different places and different spaces. And so now, instead of like, it's great, Hype Man is here, it's wonderful, the BCA has been our home for years and years and years, and that's super dope, that's amazing, but Barcelona and the Beehive don't need your wine dollars in the same way that the area restaurants around the Strand do. And so how do we support that? And then, it's about, so it's, it's, it's about creating purpose for people who maybe aren't in those communities to come into the community and discover what that community has and not in a like, and now we get to pillage, but in a like, now we can support and we can know like, oh, this is a thing. Another example of that is uh, we do these open rehearsals and our last open rehearsal for Hype Man was at the Dudley Cafe and it was amazing to watch our donors, and we know what the typical profile of some donors to theater companies are, to watch our donors come into Dudley and have this experience in Dudley Cafe that was like, oh, I've never been here before. This is really lovely. And oh, I can have wine and sake. Yeah, this is great. And then suddenly to get an email from them saying, oh, we went back and we had brunch there. Right? Like it, it helps to almost, and I hate to use this word, but destigmatize different places for people who don't go to different places, which is Boston's whole issue. <laughs> will definitely eventually get us to breaking down those things and get us to that place that you're talking about. I just got two cents. 
Um, cause Summer, yes, <laughs> set it up so good. I thought we were gonna do a good thing. Good cop, bad cop. That's what we talk. But so, uh, um, um, one of the things that kind of motivates me is listening and, and participating in the Black Lives Matter movement where there's a chant that says, I believe that we will win, right? Um, no matter what the obstacle is, but that's just belief. And then daily, I've started to um, read out loud um, Asada Shakur's affirmations. It also starts with this kind of least list of beliefs. Um, and I think it's the uh, belief that, you know, some of us are so far removed from, say, a thriving black community that we don't believe that it ever happened, right? Um, and so and even when we read about it and we see films about it, it just seems so far from our existence. But like transforming our minds to say, you know, we were once in these kind of thriving, self-sustaining communities that were really principled um, around things like self-determination and cooperative economics and stuff like that. So it's like, it's not as far that these desires and beliefs that we want, they're not as far away from us as we think they are. However, you know, the question then is like, well, what happened, right? You know, black people didn't stop being black. You know, they didn't stop believing in each other and have self-determination, but these policies come in community and, you know, we can talk about that all night and that's another panel conversation. But again, it's like, how do we get back to being self-sustaining and being thriving? Um, and there's something so valuable about our culture that, again, people want access to it and they, and, and, and yeah. So again, so again, I think it's just a belief, a belief, a belief in affirmations, and then starting to create that world um, because we know what it's like um, to be self-sustaining. We know what it's like to share economics, and we know what you know community and cultural wealth looks like um, if we just reinvest in it. Um, at the same time, fight oppressive policies and practices that have. Um, resulted in things like gentrification and other things that are ailing our community. We have time for one more question. <laughs> um, okay, hi, my name is Anna, and uh, I am the kind of person that likes to leave a panel and have some target objectives of things that I like to do. And um, maybe I'm not quite understanding of the purpose of today. So I feel like today, what I'd like to leave with is understanding one, what is uh, the purpose of these panels for BCA? That might be not necessarily be a question for you guys, but what is the goal of bringing everybody together to talk about these issues? And what are you guys trying to do for that moving forward? And then also, what are the objectives that we as a community can lead with here today as objectives moving forward? Because I feel very much that in the arts community, and particularly in the community of color, um, we have uh, issues around three different areas, around access, which is the ability to have the chance to work in some of these theater spaces, which seem foreign to us, but really should not be. And because our art is not some of the Eurocentric art form, and more of a sort of folk traditional style of dance, that tends to often prohibit us from being having this access to these theaters. And two, I think funding. So the problem that Lorenka talked about, having grant funding, grant uh, applications is an art. And uh, unfortunately, we have very different levels of nonprofit organizations. There's your very well-established com uh, companies that can pay grant writers to write their grants for them. There's your middle level. Those are the people um, that are like sort of beginning to understand the process and are getting out there, I feel like. You know, um, much of what we're talking about is more middle level. And then there's your grassroots of people who are trying to, you know, get themselves up by the bridge and they don't really know what to do, you know? So what is being done on that end to help people, <laughs> to help people at a grassroots level understand how to get grant funding um, and support one another in that process, even through methods of mentorship, whether that be, you know, um, how, do you, how do I contact you guys about mentoring me? You know, each one, teach one. Um, and then my third level is that I really feel it's a matter of your amplification, but not so much just talking to one another, but understanding how to get our art out to people who don't normally see that as art. So how do we target those areas, and how can we do that as a community moving out here forward if we realize that maybe the higher level community isn't doing that for us? Well, so for me, um this is the very first time that I really speak about what I spoke today. I always work in, and um, this is the audience perhaps that um, 
probably listening to me right now get to know a little bit what I do and how I do it. <laughs> um, and otherwise, I wouldn't have this opportunity. So for me, it's a huge uh, uh, opportunity again to express what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and uh, getting to know each other uh, also with, with the panelists. So we, th there is always an outcome of this kind of activities because I always, at, at the end, we continue working and collaborating with the people that I meet in this kind of panel. So that's on my, on my, um, uh, on my aspect, my, my point of view. And before you came, we talk about we as a traditional artist or ethnic artist, our art is not, um, it's not uh, well appreciated or it's always seen under the level. So, and we are uh, uh, a fine art too. So we really want to see and use these panels to uh, bring the, the attention to those little, you know, details. And so that's that's what I think. So yeah, and um, <coughs> excuse me, just to answer some of the other questions that you had. I mean, one of the great things about um, being able to run the network for arts and ministries of color is that we are all in connection with each other. So we know about events that are going on, we know about grant opportunities, we know about all these things that you're talking about and we are sharing them with each other and only with each other. Right? Um, and that's really important and that's one of the reasons why I started the, the network was to be able to make sure that we had a space, um, a, a way of communicating with one another because that wasn't really happening. And so that is already in existence and it's already running and it's already working and certainly for people who identify as people of color and who want to be a part of the network i mean we are open i am open to that um and when and we will we'll, we'll welcome you in the other part and the reason why we're having these specific panels and these conversations is that um we don't often get to see leaders of color in the arts talking about their work talking about why they do their work um, and really showing that they are equally as talented and as smart and as engaged and as loving of this community um, as some of the other leaders that we see having those sort of stages and those platforms. And that's why these conversations are happening right now. Um, so the internal work is happening amongst us and, and sharing of, of information and resources and then these public dialogues are to make sure that the rest of the world that we live in here in Boston understands that we are a force to be reckoned with. As well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. The only point that I will make is that we are actually going to be launching a mentorship program in the spring. Wow. So, we're for mentors and mentees. We also think that's important because, again, this is a network for you know making sure that we are supporting each other and bringing each other up and making sure that the next generation behind us is ready to go. Because they're chomping at the bit and they want in. And so um, the network is, is really sort of pushing forward to make sure that happens as well. So without further ado, I just want to say thank you all again for being on our Thank you. Really, the, so the two organizations that I really think are doing an amazing job of reaching out, it's NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts, and Arts Boston. Really, I am I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing, and the Boston Cultural Council too, the, the city of Boston is doing great things trying to reach out the community. So a big round of applause. <laughs> answer your question um, and so you know we are very thankful that Bank of America the NEA and the Boston Culture Council stepped up to say hey we believe in what you're doing we believe in this work and we're going to support you so the resources are out there the people who know about them are here and let's engage and keep moving forward Thank you. and whatever money comes your way send it our way <laughs> <laughs>